Good morning. Welcome to our worship service here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Champaign, Illinois. We are so glad that you could join us today to worship God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. pray. O oh God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's first reading is from 1 Kings, starting with the 19th chapter, the 9th verse. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return to your way, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, 
all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The next reading is from Psalm 85, beginning at the 8th verse. I will listen to what the Lord is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the 10th chapter of Romans, starting with the 5th verse. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The gospel for this 10th Sunday in Pentecost is a reading from St. Matthew, the 14th chapter beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. So why immediately? In this gospel, things seem to happen immediately. 
In verse 22, Jesus makes the disciples get into the boat immediately. In verse 27, Jesus responds to the fearful disciples immediately. And again in verse 31, when Peter starts to sink into the water, immediately Jesus reaches out his hand to catch him. But why immediately? By actual count in the New Testament, the word immediately is used 24 times in Matthew and 40 times in the Gospel of Mark. The Greek word is eutheos, and it means not only immediately, it also means straight away, or as one definition said, without hesitation, moving directly from point A to point B. The focus of immediately is on action. The focus is on right now. Immediately means don't stand around and think about it. Do it. Do it now, immediately. How many times do we tell someone, let me get back to you on that? When we say those words, we're talking about uncertainty. We're talking about second-guessing ourselves. We're not sure we're making the right decision. Let me get back to you on that. First responders need to act immediately. Emergency room doctors and nurses need to act immediately. When a lifeguard sees someone gasping for breath in the water, they need to act immediately. Their training and their ability to act must come into play. They must rely on what they know needs to be done. There's no time for hesitation or doubt. And in this gospel story, Jesus knows what needs to be done, and he does it immediately. But here's another question. Do you think this story is about Peter? Or is it about Jesus? Or is it about the disciples in general, and therefore is it about all of us who claim to be disciples of Jesus? For some, the story is the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. For others, the spotlight is placed on Peter's momentary walk on the water and then his failure to maintain that walk because of his fear and his shifted focus away from Jesus to the winds and the storm. And then there's another question. Why does Jesus look like a ghost to the disciples? Why can't they see Jesus for who he is? These are several questions. So let's take a look at a few of them in a bit more detail. First, whether the story is basically about the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. This past week I was looking at an article in Live Science Magazine which stated that there are over 1,200 species who have the ability to walk on water, either by being ultralight like a water bug, or being fast like the web-footed basilic lizard. When moving quickly, the basilic's lizard can literally cross a surface of water before sinking. On water, it can run up to 15 miles an hour, which is just a little slower than its speed on land. And these younger basilic lizards can run 33 to 66 feet on top of the water before they sink. The average human being would have to run at 67 miles per hour to keep from sinking below the surface of the water. So unless Jesus is as fast as a cheetah, it's easy to see why his walking on the water is seen as a miracle. The article I read was entitled, How to Walk on Water When You're Not Jesus. And it suggested a little trickery, an illusion. And if you use that, Humans can walk on water, and there were three specific ways included in this article. The first was the use of clever angles. In some ways, that's the easiest way to pull off the illusion of walking on water, because it's about location. You need to find a super shallow body of water, like the edges of a pool or a pond or a wide puddle, no more than an inch or so deep. 
And then if possible, you find a strip of higher land that extends out into deeper water. And if people stand a bit away, and ideally from a lower vantage point, they wouldn't be able to see beneath the surface or judge how deep the water is. And from the right angle, the surface of a rain puddle can look as deep as a lake. From the right angle, standing in a swimming pool on top of the water can look like a miracle. A few years ago, I took a photo of then presiding Bishop Mark Hansen while attending a senior pastor conference in Tucson, Arizona at this hotel swimming pool. And I entitled the photo, Bishop Hansen Walks on Water. Well, it does look that way, don't you think? The second suggestion in the article was to build a platform. Build a clear fiberglass platform because when it's totally submerged, a glass or clear plastic platform is essentially invisible. This would be harder to pull off in a natural setting where the slope and level of the ground is more varied and harder to gauge, but in the smooth man-made waters like swimming pools, it works really nice. While magicians and illusionists are obviously tight-lipped about how they pull off their miraculous feats, many skeptics assume this is how the feat of walking on water is performed by the modern showmen and illusionists. One of the most famous examples of walking on water was in 2011 when the English magician Dynamo stepped out onto the waters of the Thames River in plain view of onlookers. And after making it to the end of the assumed platform, he was pulled into a police boat, which was very likely a part of the trick meant to prove that the waters were still deep and navigable, although the ship never crossed Dynamo's path on the water. The third suggestion in the article was to use science. It said use a non-Newtonian fluid, which is a substance that has a variable shear rate. This allows for the surface of the fluid to act as a solid for brief moments of time. In lay terms, it's a thick liquid that can be walked across without sinking so long as one doesn't stop moving. The surface may ripple and deform, but it will not break or shear unless a sustained pressure is put on it because impact actually makes it thicken for a short time. There are a number of these types of non-Newtonian fluids, many of them chemically created, but probably the most common variety is a goop that you can make in your own kitchen called oobleck. It's named after the Dr. Seuss book, Bartholomew and the Oobleck. There's nothing more than an ooze made out of cornstarch and water, essentially one part water, one and a half parts cornstarch. And the resulting slurry is a thick, opaque slime that probably isn't going to fool anyone into thinking it's water, but technically it is water that can be walked on or slapped or punched or otherwise fiddled with pretty miraculously. So if our gospel is simply about the miracle of walking on water, if that's the point of the story, then we have a few explanations of why the disciples saw what they thought they saw. But what if the story is not really about Jesus walking on the water? What if the story is fundamentally about Peter? Remember that when Jesus had left, he told the disciples to get into the boat, and he remained on the shore to pray and have some time alone. And the most important detail about that is to remember is where Peter asks to go. When he sees Jesus walking on the water, Peter says, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, it's important to understand what the water represented to people who lived in ancient times. The ocean, the sea, represented frightening things to them. It represented the unknown. It represented chaos and danger. The churning of the sea, particularly in storms, represented the uncontrollable forces of nature. And when people faced storms on the sea, it represented all the forces of darkness against them. So when a ghost would appear, they are naturally fearful for their lives. They're afraid that they would become the new victims. 
But Peter asked Jesus to tell me to come to you on the water. Tell me to come to you where the danger and the unknown is. Tell me to come to you in the midst of my storm. Remember that Peter and his companions have spent nearly the whole night struggling to get across the Sea of Galilee before Jesus shows up at near daybreak. Now, it's called the Sea of Galilee, but it's really not a massive body of water, never more than seven miles across when traveling east and west. Yet this lake has been brutal. During the night, the disciples have not been able to get across the lake because the high winds have battered and thrashed their boat, and they're afraid. All night they've been threatened by the wind, water leaping up over the bow and ready to pull down the entire boat and sink it. And then they see Jesus like a ghost walking over the watery chaos, or at least it looks like him. But I doubt Jesus was trying to show off in front of his disciples. He wasn't a magician or an illusionist. Jesus was the Son of God. And I also believe that Peter's desire to join Jesus on the water was his way of connecting with Jesus. He wasn't trying to be Jesus. He was trying to be with Jesus. I believe that Peter somehow wanted to share in that inner calm that he knew Jesus had. I think Peter was wanting to put himself beyond the forces that determine our normal existence, whether for better or for worse. That's what he wanted. But when Peter steps out of the boat, he steps into the storm. And that's where all of us are. We're in the middle of the storms of our lives. Every one of us is attempting to get through our own storms. Yet every one of us desire in our innermost hearts to somehow connect with God in a way that will calm our fears and bring an inner peace to our anxious lives. Isn't that the very nature of faith? To be willing to throw ourselves into a world of disorder and expect somehow to encounter Jesus? Isn't it the nature of faith, even a little faith, to want to transcend the idea of it is what it is and try to see what different possibilities might be brought into being? Isn't it the nature of faith to wonder what other possibilities Jesus might want us to take part in? Isn't it the nature of faith even to waver from time to time when we have stepped into stressful and unfamiliar territory? Because as Peter discovered, Jesus is there in the middle of the storm. Jesus is there to provide us with life-giving stability and calm when it seems that the chaos and the ways of the world have the upper hand. There are times in your life when, when all of us feel overwhelmed, when we may be out of our boat, when we feel like we're drowning under a multitude of problems. And Jesus tells us, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. For it's times like these that Jesus will take our hand and bring us out of our own turbulence and calm the storms of our life. The Hungarian virtuoso pianist and composer Franz Liszt, for the most part, was not a religious man. But towards the end of his life, that changed. And Franz Liszt was particularly drawn to a story about St. Francis of Paola, a story which in turn was inspired by our gospel for today. St. Francis lived in the 14th century. He had hoped to get a boat across the Straits of Messina from the coast of Italy to Sicily, but he had no money and the boatman refused to grant him any favors. Indeed, he taunted him and told him to make his own way across the strait. So Francis spread his cloak on the water and blessed it in the name of God, and then lifting up a part of the cloak, like a little sail, and supporting it with his staff as a mast, he, along with his companion, stepped onto this marvelous vessel and sailed away to the amazement of those who watched from the shore. In 1863, 
Franz Liszt composed his piano piece, St. Francis Walking on the Water. It's a piece of music that remains a great challenge to any emerging classical pianist, and it's, but it is a profoundly spiritual work. A strong melodic hymn begins the piece, and then the whole piano is gradually and frighteningly caught up in a ferocious storm through rushing scales and tremulos, and gradually, tentatively, the hymn of faith fights back, resolutely walking on the waters of this terrible storm, and finally emerging in a glorious fortissimo of victory. Faith and justice and love have triumphed over the infertile elements unleashed against them. If you've never heard this piano solo, I encourage you to go to YouTube and listen to this beautiful piano piece. It's only about eight minutes long. Just type in St. Francis Walking on the Water by Franz Liszt. Listen to it and you'll see what I mean. As long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, he will be with us. Whatever storms we face, we'll get through them, and Jesus will calm our hearts. In his own heart, Peter knew that was true, and in our hearts, we know it is true as well. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Let us pray. For your whole church throughout the world, give courage in the midst of storms so that we see and hear Jesus calling, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. May we follow Christ wherever he leads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of your creation, protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Help the human family endeavor to sustain and be sustained by the resources of your hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations and their leaders, especially the United States and Japan, as we remember the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, may we be reminded by your Psalm 85 that in you steadfast love and faithfulness meet, and righteousness and peace kiss. May we come to find peace between nations, and may these nations in conflict know the peace that is the fruit of justice, and the justice that is the path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in need, everyone who calls upon your name will be saved, Lord. Accompany all who are lonely, Hear the voices of those who cry out in anguish, and support those who are frustrated in their search for an affordable place to live. We pray also for those suffering this day in Beirut after the explosion that left over 140 dead and over 5,000 people wounded. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation, Lord, we pray for those who are new to our faith community, for students and teachers preparing for a new school year, and for those struggling with unexpected hardships because of COVID-19. 
supply us generously with your grace for our life together. And if it be your will, provide us with a called and ordained pastor to lead our congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for the saints of the whole church from all times and places, and for the saints in our lives and in our community, whom you have gathered to yourself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel, to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on a desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith. Increase our hope. Deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call upon you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Oh. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and his peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.